when you come on the uh, IR over the Pacific for you. You don't have to say anything about it. It's just kind of cool to look at all the way. <coughs> Okay, welcome to our weather discussion uh, for this Friday. We um, more of a boring week till the end this week, I think, than last week for sure. But uh, Pete's showing an infrared animation of the last week over the Pacific. We're still waiting for things to really turn into something interesting in the Pacific. This is what we talked about last Friday. This disturbance then crawled up the coast, and then this next one came in of similarly small scale. So it was interesting in that regard, and this one I think is the one that makes just about to make landfall on the coast right now. Or is there yet another one? Yeah, there's another one. A couple days ago. Yeah. So here's the one right here. I can't see the date. The date's too small. It's up on the corner. Uh, okay. February 5th. All right, so we still. So that's three already that have happened in that region. All right, and that sequence of storms from the first one that we saw just off the west coast last week produced 60, 70 inches of snow oh, in some right? places in the Sierra Nevada. Well, that's and great news for you. Yeah. That's water in the bank. Are so this is current, right? So this is, this is roughly current. So that's the fourth small scale cyclone in a week that has hit Northern California uh, and the uh, Northern Sierras. That's pretty remarkable. And they're all really small scale, cold, probably cold air um, with some relationship to cold air origin. So that's interesting. Right. And they're sure. And they're at hundred at least about two or three days ago, about 134 of their snowpack percent. So they're well oh, is that right? That's good. Well that's really good. Yeah. That's very good. Of course, it could all be washed away with one really warm rain event. Yeah. Uh, let's hope that's not the case. Okay, uh, let's go to our East Coast current satellite. Because that storm on the on the coast uh, shows up. Can I, like to, can I look at the infrared? Yep. Yeah, so that storm on the coast shows up, and it's really highlighted by the fact that it's of such extraordinary small scale compared to this beast that's over Quebec. And this is a very impressive uh, deep mid-latitude cyclone with, as you can see, circulation elements that go all the way back to the subtropical eastern Pacific across Mexico, across Texas. And we'll see a little bit of the prior history of this precipitation in the central part of the country. It's kind of in dilapidated form currently, but that wasn't true even you know 18 or so hours ago. And then the cloud head is very interesting, especially in this depiction of the infrared. One can see all sorts of striations that are somewhat, they're sort of perpendicular to the direction of the motion of the whole system. So there's some sort of wave activity going on on top of that. And then the background uh, of the uh, clouds in the occluded quadrant of the storm over northern Quebec and central Hudson Bay are also quite evident in this particular uh, movie. Another thing that's interesting is how long it takes for the low level cold air to just dissipate, or especially right at the beginning. Look at how it just sits there and then boom, it starts to erode as the sun comes out. But this, all of this coloration, green, blue, and light blue, is all just a function of cold air. And we'll see some evidence for that in other, um, from other sources. And then, of course, as the cold air has made its way across the Great Lake states, you can even see in the infrared these little bands of, of uh, elevated uh, clouds, uh, cold enough to differentiate from the ground. And those are uh, lake effect snow across much of the state of Michigan, both the uh, upper peninsula and the lower, uh, and then across uh, parts of uh, Ontario province and then also New York State. So a lot of lake effect snow today, and that's not surprising when we see some other uh, sets of observations. Um, okay, it's surprisingly, we're, this is now, we're at, what are we at, like 16, 18 Z? So again. at zero Z, there was a, a fairly impressive radar uh, reflectivity band in the central part of the United States. We'll want to take a look at what might have happened to that band by looking mostly at its structure around zero Z. And I'll point out as we go forward in the discussion why that caught my eye. Uh, there was no 12Z maps this morning when I came in. They never are. I'm always in before they come in. So I was looking at the 500 millibar maps, and there was something I've never seen before. And I wanted to point out. Right. John, it's one thing I want to point out that we'll talk about a little bit in the forecast. As you can see over the central Atlantic and the southwestern and north Atlantic, you see these little low cloud patches that are moving from east to west. This one here is one. Well, not, not, not so much oh. that, the lower clouds, the, the little white. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, yeah. this is broad, eight, persistent, easterly flow. We saw some of it even last week. And it's around the around the periphery of a broad subtropical ridge that extends across from the central Atlantic into the 
Western Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. And when you often get these setups, and we've looked at this a couple times, we'll see it more in the spring, see some, sometimes in the fall. But that ridge <coughs> persistent and this trajectory of air parcels from across the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and then the Gulf of Mexico just begins to really get the air that in the southeast United States really moist, really yeah. juiced up for a significant precip. And we'll see that this pattern maintains itself for about two two weeks or so, you're going to see a significant precipitation, maybe even flooding, perhaps in the southeast. Interesting. You know, I'll, I'll add to that, though it's uh, somewhat unrelated. The fact that even in the infrared, let me stop it at one image beat at the end. Particularly, might be interesting to make this point. Yeah, you can see. Uh, actually, that one's probably better. Let's let's go with that other one. Right there is really good one, and that's uh, 12Z. So part of that's the, that it's just beginning to to dawn the day here. This is only an hour ahead. But this, uh, the darkness over the southeast states compared to the brightness of the, the grayer shade over the central United States indicates right where the cloud band is. That's a really intense front. And this is really warm. Temperatures, we'll see that when we look at the surface map. Temperatures, I think it was 68 in Raleigh this morning. 68 at 10 a.m. Right. So it's probably over 70 now. So it's really, really warm. And in line with what you're saying, you know, if you've got an easterly fetch over the whole tropical South Atlantic, uh, North Atlantic, and you, um, that air is ingested into air with a temperature of 70 degrees, the dew point can go very high. And uh, we'll see what kind of consequences that, uh, that has. I remember when I was a kid growing up in New England, we had President's Day week off. It was called the February vacation. And sometimes it was a snowy week, other times it was wet and rainy. And it must have been differentiated by how strong and uh, the subtropical high was, and then what parade of disturbances coming upstream. Because we stayed on the warm side of whatever it was. It was a sloshy week, otherwise it was snowing. One or the other, it was almost never born. So uh, that might be a setup for next week. Okay, um, let's uh, go to the uh, radar first. Let's take a look at the radar. So you can see the lake effect snow chugging across Michigan. There's really two snow belts, it seems like, in Michigan, depending on the wind direction. One of them's across the south central part of the state, the other one's across the northern portion of the lower peninsula. And then the upper peninsula, though it's got higher terrain, maybe some of this reflectivity gets uh, you know, masked a little bit by that. Probably pretty good lake effect snows across much of that. And then it's also true in the northern part of New York State and then in the Buffalo Rochester area, pretty good snow. And then Cleveland, uh, well, north northeast Ohio is probably better way to say it. Cleveland can sometimes on the west side of town have nothing and on the east side of town be buried. So that's an interesting particular location. And then there's a, a similarly unorganized precipitation. One almost gets the idea these same striations you see in the in the lake effect seem to appear on a slightly broader scale over Texas, but completely different mechanism is most likely the case. These are uh, probably uh, unorganized convective uh, cells that are tied to the broad southwesterly flow that's come from, as you noticed on the satellite, well off the coast of Mexico, and uh, perhaps connected with the circulation that's driving these cells <laughs> off the coast of New England, finally, into maritime Canada. And they're tied with the big storm in northern Quebec. And then on the west coast, uh, if we can slide a little bit over there, Pete, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, we're just getting landfall north of San Francisco Bay of some of the first showers from that fourth small-scale disturbance that's making its way into Northern California in one week. And then there's a little bit of precipitation invading from the northwest over the strait of Juan de Fuca into northwest Washington, probably making its way to Seattle later today. Hey, John. Yeah. I mean, going to school in the Pacific Northwest, just along the west coast, is it surprising to you that these types of systems are able to come ashore and certainly at elevation you're getting significant snowfall, but it's really even cold near the surface? And this is air that's at a trajectory over a good portion of the Pacific, North Pacific. It's yeah. not super warm. Is that surprising at all, or what's the what keeps it cold? Uh, that is a really good question. One thing that can keep it cold is we'll have to see in the surface map. I don't really know what's going on here in the Pacific Northwest today. We'll discover it together. But I, I know what you're saying. So when we had a half a dozen snow events in the eight years I was in Seattle, a couple of them were pretty big, and um, one only one of them was one where the air was just really cold and the. Uh, and the uh, ocean air was made to ride over the dome of cold air. Every other one, we were right on the boundary. And that boundary is sometimes set up by cold air massing in interior British Columbia and then coming down the Fraser River Valley and spilling into the sound. So you have a really shallow, sometimes just deep enough layer of cold air that snow is half deciding to melt before it gets into that cold air. And it comes down as kind of a wet, refrozen 
a crusty stone. And that's five out of the six that I remember. Other times, there's just a broad uh, surge of cold air that comes in in a similar way, but with a much stronger surge, it comes all the way off the coast. Right. And then you have a little disturbance that comes along the Barraclinic zone offshore, and it's enough to kick up precipitation. This does not look like that type. It right. looks like one of the Fraser River Valley ones. But the one off California? Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't looked. I don't believe there's a cold air draining off the continent. Probably it seems like not. this is right underneath the upper low, which yeah. is, it will be cold, but I'm surprised they can maintain the the depth of that cold air and make it cold enough so that even at a yeah, reasonable elevation you get snow. It's a good question. What are the, I, don't, I haven't looked at what are the elevations here for snow. 1,500 feet or is it higher than that? 3,000? Uh, I think probably at two, at least 2,000 okay. last week. But, um, yeah, it's usually 15-ish in some of these near misses in Seattle. I know, I, I've never really I just, uh, yeah. paid attention to what it is down uh, in the central Sierra uh, or the coast range. So yeah, I don't know. There would be no particular reason why that air should be uh, stay, should stay so cold. On the other hand, it's coming across a very cold ocean, so it's not going to get it's exceptionally warm or even uh, 50 degrees, 52 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that, and that's fairly shallow. Uh, so I, that's a good question. I'm not sure about that. Okay, can we take a look at the surface map now, Pete? And let's take a survey of some of the current temperatures around our own region. We were cold this morning. I think the low was minus 2 or something like that. might have been lower than that at the airport, of course, when we don't need it. Uh, but today was easily the most uncomfortable day of the last two weeks for me at the bus stop because it was windy and minus two instead of just minus 20 and not much wind. So it was uncomfortable. It's only gotten up to plus three, a little warmer in Milwaukee. Broadly speaking, temperatures are, we're about at the zero line. Temperatures are below zero almost everywhere else to our north and west. And they started out a lot colder than this. There were temperatures in central Minnesota in the mid minus 30s this morning, quite a number of minus high teens and minus 20s. So it's a cold air mass, and it's centered pretty much in this location. The, uh, I think a lot about the Mandan Indian Nation and how they lived for centuries in this part of North Dakota and southern Saskatchewan and Manitoba. I don't know how they did it, but uh, they were constantly under assault of temperatures in the minus 30 to minus 50 range. And that's kind of the case today. Uh, remarkable people, undoubtedly. And um, so here's some of the lake effect snow across Michigan. Heavy snow at uh, is that Wellington or Grand Rapids, I forget which place that is. That's heavy snow. I like that. And then mostly light snow everywhere else in the lake affected region, except Erie has moderate snow. So, a nice snowy day in the lakes region. And cold everywhere. This is one of the, I think you'll see this in the long term forecast. Finally, there'll be some exceptionally cold air making its way almost to the Gulf Coast by next Saturday, I think, in eight days. And that's the first time. But places like St. Louis, maybe even places uh, down near Louisville have had. Um, Temperatures in the, you know, in the mid 20s for a number of days in February. So it's not been a particularly warm or nice winter for them, and some somewhat colder than normal. But many of the places well to the south have yet to experience any particularly intense cold snap. That's about to change. Look at South Carolina. You yeah, 79 South Carolina. at look at that. 79 at Charleston. 80 at uh, I don't know what that city is. Um, and we had earlier this morning, it was 68 at Raleigh. It's gotten up to 72. It's in the mid to high 70s along the southeast coast. It's at 80 at um, Wilmington. Very, very warm. 79 at, what is that? Is that a or Norfolk? Yeah, in Norfolk. Yeah, 79 at Norfolk. But look at the northwesterly winds at higher latitude, uh, bringing the temperatures in the mid 50s. So this is all post frontal. Uh, and this is pre frontal. So there's. Unfortunately, the Appalachians are kind of in the way, but you can see some example of really big dip temperature differences. Northeast Tennessee, 46, and meanwhile, south of Asheville, 71. So uh, there's something in between those locations for sure that's accounting for that, you know, that, that temperature contrast. Uh, so let's go off to the west coast and see what it looks like over there. No reports in this rather sparse set of observations of rain yet on the coast in California. There's light snow at elevation, uh, or maybe not at elevation, at Portland. And in 32 with 26 uh, dew point at Seattle, so that's prime for precipitation to fall of snow. It's snowing in Olympia, 34 over 31. Really able to do it in those conditions. Uh, and then in the eastern part of the state, which is an entirely different state, uh, it's um, a lot colder and snowier. Okay, let's take a look at uh, some of our upper level charts if it could be. Start at um, 500 millibars. 
And what I noticed, and this is not the map that I saw, but it's still evident. What I noticed at the zero Z map is this intense strip of really high varicosity. Look at how narrow that is. That's 10 degrees across that. Um, 16 at Rochester, minus 31 in northern Michigan, and, and the analysis is, is uh, creative, and I, I like that. And it suggests that much of that paraclinic contrast is in one narrow strip. If we could look at the zero Z map, because I'm going to—it's a foreshadowing of what we're going to show uh, from this 5 b just just the almost last one. Yeah. This is what I saw when I came into work today, and I thought, "What? Are you kidding me? Look at that!" And then we look at the observations. It's 18 at Lincoln, it's 17 at Monette, and it's minus 33 at Omaha, and we've got minus 30 in Minneapolis. Too bad we don't have a sounding in Iowa. Wouldn't it be great to know that Des Moines is like minus 29? But to, but it's an incredibly sharp paraclinic zone. I do not have any prepared statements to make about where it came from, but I do have some things I can say about what consequences are of it of that structure. And now, having just seen the troll Z map, this is maintained for a reasonable amount of time. So we'll come back to that uh, later. Let's do a survey of all of the troll Z maps now instead. Thanks. This movie does allow us actually to try and trace it, but I don't want to trace it without having done it myself. I don't want to do it. Fine. So uh, we saw 500. Let's look at 300. We know it's got this intense paraclinicity uh, in the southern portion of the Great Lakes states. We have a maximum wind speed of 156 or so knots right along the Ohio River on in southern Indiana and Ohio. That's pretty intense. And that's really the main jet feature in the continent of the United States. And then a strong northerly flow coming out of uh, northern Canada which may well affect what's going on in the Puget Sound and in the Pacific Northwest generally. And then if we could go to uh, 700 millibars, well, before 500, one more time, because I didn't make mention of what's on the West Coast. And that is, uh, here's a cold upper low. Probably this is the minus 30, that's got to be the minus 30 contour. And we saw in the satellite that that's got a, a lot of, uh, you know, open cellular convection and it's a small scale disturbance. Undoubtedly, it's been ushered southward, probably it's developed as it's done so, in this northerly flow along the coast. So one of the reasons it stayed warm is it didn't really leave, uh, it didn't get over the ocean until this last little segment. So that's probably a, a nice uh, advantage if you're trying to stay cold, uh, even in the lower troposphere. You don't have very much time and, and relatively cool waters over which you might experience moderation. So this is going to be another impactful storm in the northern Sierra. And then maybe this northerly flow with an embedded short wave trying perhaps to emerge offshore. If it gets offshore, it turns into a big snow event in the Pacific Northwest. If it stays in the straight northerly flow and stays at the longitude of Seattle or even a little bit east of that, then it's not quite the same threat. Um, so there's the baroclinic zone I mentioned earlier at 500 millibars. There's a second pretty intense baroclinic zone up in the warm frontal region of this giant complex. And so uh, this is not surprising. We saw our storm is rotating around in, uh, around the southern Hudson Bay, and so the cold front trailing this way near the surface of the warm frontal cloud band extending up in that location in central and northern Quebec. So it's a pretty nice looking disturbance, and it's pretty chilly air, uh, as one might expect at this time of year. So what I wanted to do, uh, let's go uh, one more to 750, and then I want to go to this time. We'll go to the 700 first. Uh, here's the warm frontal baroclinicity for this storm centered as it is at 700 right in the southern portion of James Bay. And here's that paraclinic zone. Uh, and of course, it encroaches further and further eastward the further down you go, because this is a deep, backward sloping uh, paraclinic zone. But it's pretty intense cold front. And we, it's not surprising, we went from mid 20s early yesterday morning to minus two today, all by cold infection. And so it's a pretty intense looking disturbance. Let's see what it looks like at 850. Yeah, same thing. Very intense paraclinic zone with the cold infection at 850 leading all the way down into uh, southeastern Alabama. Uh, yeah, Alabama and then to the coast of, of Mississippi, barely sparing New Orleans at 850. Strong paraclinic zone all the way along the coast. And so we noticed, um, what we, didn't do was, we did look at those temperatures. The temperatures in the 70s, nearly 80 in this whole region, they're all prefrontal. And that's all that's prefrontal in the whole central and eastern United States. And then here's the warm frontal zone at 850. It's a little more diffuse, but there's broad warm infection in a region of concentrated warm infection. In fact, differential warm infection from Haute Maine up uh, to north of the Maritimes. And so plenty of, of reason to suspect there's decent frontogenetic dynamics somewhere in that broad paraclinic region. 
And the feature at 850 millibars off the West Coast doesn't look that much different from what it did at 500. So this is bar barotropically stacked. Uh, it's not a cold core at 850. It's kind of got a little bit of a semblance of some sort of draping uh, baroclinic structure, but it's not really a frontal structure. Okay, so let's, um, if we could be, let's go to this 5 b that I had uh, prepared. And this is, the reason I took the 0Z analysis, or the GFS run from 0Z, is because that's what I saw when I first came to work. So I saw the 0Z 500 millibar map, and I had to see what it looked like in 3D. So this is the GFS analysis at the same time, 0Z, uh, on this morning. And this is at uh, 5.3 kilometers, so it's approximately 500 millibars. And so you can see that... That re that's replicated quite nicely. There's a very intense baroclinic zone across the central United States. These are every three degrees, so that's 294, 70369. This is 15 degrees across half the state of Missouri and across the southern half of, of Kansas. That's a really intense 500 millibar baroclinic zone. And it's got reasonable um, horizontal extent. And then, of course, in the region where the disturbance itself is mostly a vortex, the baroclinic zone can't tighten as well. It gets tighter again when deformation can play a role, and that's to the north over uh, northern Quebec, northern Ontario, and central Hudson Bay. So it's a pretty nice baroclinic structure, even at 500 millibars, one can see that from last night. So let's take a look at uh, a vertical cross section. I think it's going to be about right there. Yeah, so that's where I wanted to look at it. And so here's the most intense part of the baroclinicity at uh, 500. So let's tilt that up and see what it looks like. So this is a really interesting, thanks Pete, you're so good at this. This is a, and this is every three degrees as well. This is a really intense baroclinic zone. It comes right down to the leading edge of this set of isotropes. Makes up the leading edge of a surface-based cold front, which is a separate feature. You can see that. That's separated somewhat from this upper tropospheric baroclinic zone. But they do meld together right at the front edge of this disturbance. And uh, that is where we have some pretty intense convective activity. If we could for a second go to, what was it? I had it on our main page. I had that, uh, yeah, the image on guy. So here's the reflectivity from a few hours before that time. And I, if we could step forward, I think you stepped with just that. I want you to notice that there becomes a little bit of a separation between this linear line that goes all the way up into southern Indiana, uh, Illinois. That is separate from the main precipitation band. And that's kind of interesting. I think there's two different disturbances driving some of the precipitation elements here. I don't have enough time to do a full diagnosis. But this seems to be driven by, as I'll show you some evidence for that, by a structure in the middle troposphere. This seems to be driven, this rope cloud, which has a nice reflectivity band along it, seems to be driven by the front edge of the surface front and um, processes that are somewhat separate from what's going on in the middle and upper troposphere. And then there's a cloud I mean, a precipitation element in Ohio and parts of eastern Indiana that does not conform to the back turning in the baroclinic zone in the middle troposphere. So, very complicated structure, it seems to me. Um, and this is very heavy precipitation uh, that's coming down in many of the locations along that front. So, if we could go all the way to almost zero Z, that'll be a coincident time. I think it goes to 2355 or something. John, the rope crop type feature, um, is some reflectivity there. Are there meteors, or do you think it might be some dust that's or something? Right. Sorry, the other things getting turned up ahead of the... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, look at this. Even this, just minutes before zero Z. So that's why I wanted to get to the time of, of interest for the rest of the this by feet. Look at... There's variations in the reflectivity there. It, it even disappears in some locations, but it's intense in a couple of spots. I don't know what to say about that. It's a reasonable question. I don't know. I guess I would... In my first guess about this, I would just say this is probably actual reflectivity. And if you had station data, you'd actually be able to see maybe a spike in the precipitation rate disappears and then the next thing comes in, which is a longer duration, probably this feature right in here. Yeah, you're going to have to do with the proximity to the different radar sites too, because the farther away you get from an individual site, you're looking higher in the atmosphere, so you're not sampling at a constant level. And it's really shallow, yeah, so yeah. shallow. Is, so do you think that's the, is that the edge of the surface front itself? Yes, I think that's the edge of the surface cold front. And that's not the same as whatever is driving this precipitation um, back behind it. And, and, of course, the interesting thing to me is that the difference between the two is not uniform. So there's something really intriguing about the 3D structure here that uh, I'll try and say a few things about their guesses at this point, but it's uh, interesting nonetheless. So let's just keep in mind that this band at zero Z goes all the way from far northeastern Ohio down to 
on western Louisiana with almost no interruption. And then there's this rope cloud out ahead of it, especially from, you know, the Louisville area down to uh, just to the west of New Orleans. So that's kind of the structure you might want to have in mind when we're looking at the rest of the Vis-5B. So let's take a look back at that. So here's our cross section. And um, let's put on the horizontal front of Genesis through the H. That's in red. So this is only the positive values. And so you get the idea that, and remember this this uh, line right here is at about 5.3 kilometers. So the, the um, front of genetic uh, axis is along this surface-based cold front and then intrudes deeply along the upper tropospheric front all the way to probably about six or so kilometers, maybe even six and a half. And then there's this intriguing little piece that's out here to the east of that main feature aloft that has a great, or same magnitude and is aligned along this much weaker baroclinic zone uh, that's just to the east of the main band. And then if you put the vertical motion plume on top of this peak, that's what seems to be driving the most intense vertical motion. So uh, here is this, this linear band that goes all the way into the lower stratosphere. It's very impressive um, updraft um, at this time. It's no longer there. Now it's just 18 hours later. It's kind of gone away. But this was very intense at this time and it seems to me in the first cut that this mid tropospheric front of Genesis is probably around seven and a half kilometers. I think that's exactly what it was in fact. Seven and a half kilometers. That might be driving much of what's falling in that second precipitation band. The one that's the more uh, wider and more long lasting band and maybe it's what's going on right at the nose of the front that's producing this rope cloud. Even though the vertical motions are not as intense, they're more proximate to the um, QV, to the vertical, uh, to the water vapor, which at the same time, one gram per kilogram is all the way up to seven kilometers. That's really high water vapor content for that elevation. And notice it's kind of being driven upward, I think, by the circulation associated with this front of genetic band. And then here's the axis of it. Maybe we take the yellow off, you can see the vertical of the uh, plume a little better. There's the plume of um, high water vapor content. And of course, it doesn't get past the surface front, but it's kind of being churned upward there. And give it an extra kick is my presumption by the time it sees this feature at about seven and a half kilometers. So it's very complicated structure. One of the things that would be intriguing to do in, in more detail would be to look at what's the evolution of this upper tropospheric baroclinic zone. And how does it get itself conjoined with this surface-based frontal zone, which is not very deep, maybe about two and a half kilometers deep. Uh, and some of this is actually under the orography, but this is this is a shallow uh, octic front type structure. And it's phased nicely with this deeper baroclinic zone that maybe has an upper frontal or uh, origin. So that was interesting. Can we take the front of Genesis off for a minute, Pete? And then if we put on the moist PV in the cross section, PZM. I've oh, I put it in green. Maybe we got to change the color. Sorry. Let's uh, make it. Uh, I don't know anything else besides green. Perfect. Perfect. <clears throat> so I've shown only values that are as large as 0 0.3. So these are all low values with a moist PV, which is <laughs> surrogate for the static stability. And so right up to the edge of where that plume of fairly high water vapor content values are, you have really low PV in this region. And put the vertical motion on again as close as it can get to the proximate generator of the circulation, it goes and it responds to the weak stratification and the, and the presence of the forcing to drive this really intriguing vertical structure in the, in the uh, vertical motion and probably helps to account for some of what we see in the interesting precipitation distribution associated with this storm at this time. So I found this uh, quite interesting. If we get everything else off in the vertical, Let's put just the PV on, so you can see what this. I uh, put theta. I'm sorry, Pete. I meant to keep theta. Take the moist PV off and put the regular dry PV. You can see that this is the one PVU isotel, and there is a, a tendency for the well, not a tendency, but a history perhaps of subsidence along the sloping isotropes to drag the trophic pause down. This is just high PV because the stability is so high on top of the aqua gas. So it's a really nice uh, combined structure that's going on here at this time. I wanted to show one more thing. We take the PV off, and then uh, we can take this off too for the time being, and then put theta E in the cross section, and theta. This is not always the case, but when you're up in the stratosphere, it is. Theta and theta E are coincidence. You don't see any difference between the two. But look at this. On top of the octave, yeah, there's not much difference. The values are different, but they're nearly parallel to each other, almost everywhere. And here, we're just underground, so that doesn't count. 
but it's right out in front in this location where um, we saw the big updraft where the theta E lines in white are not the same as the theta lines. In fact, the gradient of theta E is much larger than the gradient of theta in the horizontal. That's a consequence of the water vapor uh, presence right at the nose of this structure. In addition to that, if we can go to the horizontal map of both theta and theta E, and I put them at 5.3 kilometers, uh, maybe it's hard for you to see. Let's take theta E off just for a minute. So here's theta, and this is where that updraft is going straight up uh, at the surface. So you know, it's a deep frontal structure, so the updraft's here in western Tennessee. Now, the, there's a broad thermal wind that's going from southwest to northeast. If we put theta E on top now, it seems that, the, that there's slight positive theta E advection by the thermal wind, because you're cutting across the theta E isotropes in such a way as to drag higher theta E values poleward in that channel in the red, which is the direction of the thermal wind. It turns out that's an adiabatic mechanism for increasing the static stability. Uh, if it were the other way around, if you had negative theta E infection by the thermal wind, you would decrease the static stability right at the front edge where the forcing is driving the updraft. But in this case, it's increasing the static stability. And as it turns out, as you saw in the beginning of the discussion, uh, the precipitation band, which was very intense at zero Z, quickly eroded away to nothing. I don't know if that's because the forcing was different or if it was because the stratification was improved uh, to such an extent that the forcing wasn't sufficient any longer to drive heavy precipitation. It could be a combination of both, it most likely is. I haven't had the time to investigate that, but it's a science question that is of interest to me. How did this structure, first of all, and then what happens subsequent to zero Z to lead to the rapid demise of the precipitation band? But that's one theory, is that by purely adiabatic means, the stability is being increased systematically, and that, that doesn't work in favor of sustaining the precipitation. Uh, with somewhat meager forcing that seems to exist. So that's what I wanted to show you about this uh, this case. I guess I'm all done. Okay. Thanks, Doug. So what we're going to first start off with uh, 54 hours, we think. Um, as John mentioned, it's been sort of relatively quiet week. I mean, some excitement with the, uh, the frozen precipitation, the freezing precipitation yesterday and last night, and then that's over. It's cold, it's dry, like in the middle of winter, so more snow is uh, perhaps on tap. So we're going to first just jump to Sunday at noon, and this just shows the forecast surface map from the GFS for quality this morning, for quality this morning which shows sort of the accumulated precipitation of the last six hours ending at this uh, time. Shows a broad area of light precipitation, uh, light snowfall over the upper Midwest, and then some freezing precipitation and rain to the southeast. And what I'd like to do is just sort of trace through this because we'll go back in time and look at some of the origins for this particular event, uh, look at some of the forcing for it, and then also look at its, its demise. <coughs> so if you just put one six hour period further ahead, you can, ahead, you can see the um, this begins to lighten up considerably. Part of that's due to the nature of the flow in which um, one of the ways that conspires to regenerate the precipitation begins to get uh, sheared out. And we'll see that in the forecast. So first of all, let's go back to 54 hours, please. And let's go to the um, well, dynamics here. We're going to look at the upper troposphere at this point. We'll look at finally more more, which is here. And so even at this time, you know, the precipitation that we're seeing is just out ahead of a very weak wave, which we'll see as we go we're to go forward in time. We'll see this wave begins to weaken. You can see just some minor curvature associated with the wave, certainly a little bit of shear, geostrophic shear uh, vorticity uh, that's associated with it in this broad southwesterly flow. <clears throat> but it's as this wave enters this region, which is you know, maybe utterly mildly confluent, this, this feature begins to weaken. So we're going to see some, we'll see that happen as we go forward in time. But let's go backwards and trace the origins of this particular curvature maximum. Right. It looks much more developed in the northeastern Colorado near Sterling. We'll go back a couple more clicks. It's originating you know, it's out over the western Colorado on um, Sunday morning. We can go a little bit uh, faster back. I think this is the feature that we saw just coming on the west coast. Morning. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like 30 hours. Oh, that's right. But this is the feature that slides down the west coast. We saw it from the 
rain showers and precipitation just offshore uh, this morning off of the California coast. It's this feature right here, which is going to be eventually be the big feature that produces our next bout of snow. And if I had to guess, I would look carefully. This next, this feature that's off the Pacific Northwest will probably be our significant snowfall producer midweek next week. And that's in a perfect spot for Pacific Northwest snowstorm, the rare Pacific Northwest snowstorm. So very low heights and offshore. there's only cold temperatures as well. Yeah. And you're getting purposely surface rain and offshore flow. So we'll actually have a look at the origins of that. So this is our snowfall producer just off the coast. If you go back to just keep clicking back maybe every like 12 hours so we don't have to look for every single look. So you see it right there. And then morning was way off here. So this is the feature that's going to give us around 48 to 60 hours, um, a little bit of snow. And let's just sort of follow the origins of the snowfall and try to understand some of the mechanisms that are responsible for producing the snowfall. We'll go to the surface, first of all, and let's just go to 24 hours. <clears throat> okay, we'll look at this map. Not much upstream of us, 24 hours. You can see over us by tomorrow morning, we have a large anticyclone located over Minnesota. Uh, temperature infections, at least the geostrophic temperature infections at the surface are rather weak at this point. Thickness is certainly uh, cold enough for snow. Um, but if you go to our west, you can see just on the western periphery of this broad anticyclone, we have rather strong geostrophic warm infection, uh, thickness infection, that's just beginning to start over the uh, central and northern plains. Go look at the, uh, say the dew points. You can see this air is pretty dry. Okay, you're looking at dew points that are all you know, 25 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Those 60s that we saw right along the Gulf Coast a few days ago or last week um, <clears throat> have all but disappeared and pushed to the south with um, that cyclone that just went through the front that John was just talking about. It sort of dried up the entire continent. And so while we have the warm advection occurring, and some might argue it's even localized warm advection, we're going to get into a parts in a second. This air is so dry, it's going to have to travel a huge distance northward and upward before it reaches the begins to condense and produce precipitation. So it's going to be a while before this air mass begins to moisten up enough for us to see any or frozen precipitation. Go back to the surface map. And let's go to 36 hours. Grant Petty was asking me yesterday, is it routine or has it ever happened before with a sea level pressure here? Adjust the level pressure gets near 1050. I didn't know. <clears throat> I think it yeah. probably isn't the most unprecedented thing, but I don't know. We we'll probably have, I the State Climatology Office has, knows what that record is. Yeah, I looked we've around. probably been in the 1040s many times. Yeah, I would think we've been 1040 a lot, but I wonder about 1050. We almost got there in this forecast. I'm, I'm uh, tracking that. That's something interesting to think about. The high is now shifted to our east by Saturday evening. This is now 6 p.m. Saturday evening. Warm invention is continuing. Again, this is there, and it's not following this trajectory, but you can see warm invention over much of the southern and central plains. The warm invention sort of halts as we get up into uh, Nebraska. But still, you haven't seen any big outbreak of precipitation. Some along the Gulf Coast as things begin to moisten up a little bit over there. The wave that we were following initially has moved into the Intermountain West, and it's sort of gotten somewhat diminished. You can see a thickness trough over Arizona at this point, 36 hours. Again, nothing um, particularly, uh, I would say, exciting or something that just jumps at you say, oh, this is going to be a snowfall no producer. Let's look at 850 millibars at this point, the heights and temperatures, and we'll look at the uh, yeah, temperatures. Thank you. Here. So we can see this flow from southern Texas all the way up to, the, uh, to Iowa. There is certainly strong warm induction in this region. And it, it's arguably that it's argued that it's somewhat localized form reduction, the nose of this. But as we'll see when we look at the dew points and the relative humidities, this is still very dry air, so not much the way of precipitation. There may be some very high wispy clouds by Sunday evening or Saturday evening. Nothing in the way at this point. Um dew points is a good precipitation. Cold over us, certainly cold enough to snow the zero line as well to our south. Okay. And let's look at the uh, at least the surface two points at that point. Oh, we've gone up about 10 to 15 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in terms of the dew points because it's still really dry air. Okay, we'll go to 48 hours surface map. 
So at 48 hours, we're finally beginning to see precipitation break out. You can see the precipitation types, snow on the northern edge of this. Uh, this is a 6, 6 a.m. on Sunday, a little bit of freezing rain, frozen precipitation, and then finally just plain rain over the southern plains. Okay, we've got this persistent southerly flow, but what the, the thing that will be of interest is um, how much will be moistened up the column, and what's the forcing mechanism for this precipitation. So the first thing I'd like to look at is going back to the dew points. Okay. And going up even more. Again, this is the, the air that's precipitating is obviously it's, it's moving northward. It's also rising and condensing, so you don't have to be really moist at this level. But if you take that air, that's even as we have mixing ratios here. Whatever those mixing ratios would be in, from the surface or near the surface, as it moves northward, it's ascending to higher level. It's cooling, it's condensing, producing precipitation. I mean, um, so. It may be dry here, but where the precipitation is actually being uh, created aloft, which only moistened up most of it here. Let's now look at 850 millibar uh, temperatures and heights. So this broad area of precipitation that was um, here. So you can see across parts of Iowa, two things to note. First of all, there's this broad diffluent flow, so this is suggested some point of deformation and perhaps frontogenesis. You can see the normal component of the winds as you go from warm to cold, these winds are decreasing. So this is very frontogenetical. But it's also, there is, to my eye, sort of localized more reduction in this region, which would certainly help with the production of precipitation if it were moist enough, which you've seen the models already being produced precipitation. We go ahead just six hours from this, this time period. Okay. I think the frontogenesis has increased just a little bit more. And you can see this sort of band of a region where the frontogenesis is. We have the winds again. We go toward the this boundary, at least 850 millibars. The normal component of the flow here seems to be weakening just a little bit. But broadly in this region is where you might expect to see um, some of the banded precipitation, yeah, accumulated precipitation. Let's look at the surface map at the same time. We have a small area of precipitation. Now it's begun to expand broadly in this region. Other feature I want to take a look at is our 500 millibar trough, just to keep track of where, where that's how that's evolved, and we can go to the so-called dynamics. That name, but that's what they call it. But here's this trough uh, feature that's out ahead of this. Again, I think it's this is more based on frontogenesis in the lower troposphere than the upper trough, but certainly this isn't. It's not hurting in terms of precipitation, but it's maybe in the northwest part of the area of precipitation. Let's go ahead at six hours and 500 millibars to 60 hours in the forecast. And you can see this curvature maximum is just beginning to shear out. Okay, so it was more pronounced was in the southwest as it moved into this flow. It's getting weaker. You can see the curvature is also being lost. So this feature is going to begin to sort of just fade in terms of its ability to help support any vertical motion. Let's go to back data to 50 millibars for temperature and height. Okay. Well, the forecast of this is going to diminish. I'd say this isn't particularly uh, frontogenetic. There is a little bit of deformation in this region, but it's not particularly strong. We saw that the component of the flow, well, we saw that the upper trough that was just to our west has begun to fade. So at this point, you perhaps expect that the, the accumulation rates of our precipitation production is probably going to weaken at this point. Let's take a look at that at 60 hour. Might be frontalytic right along the Wisconsin Illinois border. And Great. But at least we're on the cold side. If that's true, then we, we get vertical motion from the frontalysis. A little bit left. And we go ahead another six hours. Oof. Wall is totally begins to fall apart. But the other aspect of this is, and uh, yeah, focus more on our, our snowfall, is just south of this region of high barochronicity over the southeastern United States. And we saw in the satellite imagery that easterly flow that was across the Caribbean into the uh, southeastern part of the Chile, southeast Gulf of Mexico, and eventually this area turn, begins to turn northward around this broad, uh, broad south, uh, subtropical high. As it, you know, getting approaches this baroclinic zone, it's going to undergo some significant lifting, and with it is the production of this precipitation over the southeastern United States. Now, this isn't awfully heavy. The air isn't super moist at this time of year. 
it is warm, there's certainly a thermal contrast that Don was referring to earlier, that's going to be persistent. But you take that relatively moist air with this baroclinic zone, you're going to get reduction of precipitation. One of the interesting things in the forecast beyond this time period is how this, how stubborn this anticyclone is in terms of the overall production of precipitation here. I think the two or three big events with heavy precipitation here with the southeast United States being somewhat protected from significant cold air outbreaks, but we just get, we get continual surges of precipitation because I think of the stubborn southeast, uh, eastern, uh, western, western Atlantic um, anticyclone. Before we get to that, we'll look at the accumulated precipitation for the entire forecast. Let's follow this next disturbance that's out in the western part of the United States. You can see some evidence of its existence in the thickness trough. That was the second landfalling um, in latitude cyclone off the west coast. And if you go ahead to uh, get 90 hour, 84 hours, please. This is on Monday, uh, Monday evening. You can see a new cyclone beginning to develop down in the central plains. Again, this persistent southeasterly flow impinging upon the Bayer Clinic zone now in the warm sector of this cyclone. We're getting significant precipitation that outbreak. Some of the forecast models also forecasting uh, with this moisture surging north, with a cold anticyclone to the north. Maybe it's either an ice storm or snowstorm in the Atlantic. That's something that's you see how that plays out. But for us, this is or for this region looks like this could be the big the big event for the week uh, coming up. We go to 96. That's a, uh, a really nice example of the so-called inverted trough of the high plains. That, yeah, look at that it's about a Rossby radius away from the Rocky Mountains in many of those locations, and so you set up this this puddle of cold air that and that's a frontogenetic feature. And uh, Kashashian and Bosa talked about that, I think, in the 90s, and um, looked at that in great detail. It's really a, a snow producer over the Dakotas a lot of times. So the cold air, you're referring to this cold air just behind this trough? Yeah, that's you're right, that's what I'm thinking. Right. Okay, so that helps to produce this, but this is due to this broad westerly flow across the rock. Probably, there's trough is that's induced by that, yeah. Right. It can't really do it. You can't really dislodge the, the low-level cold air, but it, it produces something uh, downstream. Yeah, it's kind of interesting structure. We have lots of precipitation along it. We're in light precipitation. This time it's going to 96 hours. It begins to move away from the Rockies. We can see it really well developed. We'll see this in Fire Gold Mars as well. Nice upper trough. Nice curve, you know, changing curve. Let's actually look at the Fire Gold right, rather than the range and thickness. Much more exciting. Oh, yeah. Service. Look at that. Probably, I'm guessing, an upper front that's uh, is connected to what we wanted to guess. If we actually look at that. But look at the curvature going from strongly cyclonically curved flow to relatively straight flow. There's going to be an atrostrophic um, burst of, upper, of uh, divergence at upper levels associated with the change curvature. So let's go surface to 120 hours. So let's go 108 hours, please. Nine ninety six to nine ninety one. So a nice track right across uh, northern Illinois and south, the southeastern Wisconsin and Michigan. Might have some liquid precipitation between these times, but also it's going to leave a trail of maybe moderate, uh, moderate to heavy accumulations of snow in its wake. So that's by Tuesday evening. In fact, we go back one quick just to see what happened in your meeting in that time. Yeah, southeastern part of the state with some liquid precipitation. We believe this explicitly we're probably just right on the edge of the, the snow uh, frozen precipitation where you go to snow before the sands. And we scroll that go to 108 hours. Let's go to one more map time after that, 114, and then we're going to look at the total accumulated precipitation. It's going to be 10 to 1. So this, by this time, it should be over. All the way down, all the way down winter weather. Let's do 10 to 1. Biggest thing to do. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Yep. Just, and it'll be. Well, actually, it's uh, break this into two pieces. Let's look at the 24 hour accumulator piece. Oh, one quick. I'm not that sorry. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to zoom in, we can go continental, regional, US. The 4 4 here. And for the prior, we just, you know, the, we can go to 100, go to the total. We can add to that. So actually, the one that we got on Sunday could be another four inches. Yeah, it might be about the same, and then there'll be a layer of ice in between the two. Right. <laughs> a nice layer of ice in between. Underneath, yes. Right. Okay, so those are our two big, uh, not big, two modest snow events. 
for the action of Sunday one being a little bit more uh, bullish than I would have anticipated based on how transient the feature was. We can go back to the surface map and I want to just take some selective uh, times going forward about 168 hours and we'll go back to the full US. A lot of precip over in Southeast United States with this. Uh, this is next next week, a week from today. Um, getting cold again. The snowfall and that front makes it well into the Southeast of the United States. Let's just go ahead to 216 hours. Yeah, just look at those low thicknesses getting all the way down to Texas. That's the first time that it's been cold, and it's going to be straight and southward in that on the right. eastern side of that anticyclone. So really cold on the central Gulf Coast in the weekend next weekend. I suspect it doesn't last too long. Go 216 hours. Yeah, we've recovered again, and again we have this this high sliding off the east coast. Let's go. Uh, just got another several hours out to 288. Just jumping down. Won't show up here, but again, getting these really low thicknesses all the way down into the far southeast part of the United States has been relatively tough to do. Yeah, and finally, 384. Look at the sloppy. Uh, February vacation that's shaping up for Southern New England too. Yeah. Again, yeah, we get this next burst of again more heavy precipitation over the southeast United States. So if you look at the total mm -hmm. precipitation, total QPF over the what two, uh, the 16 days in the forecast. This is the total QPF right here. It's just striking I mean, how many big events are expected yeah. to occur during this time period. We have a cyclone track that's through us. Yeah, well, yeah, a little bit on Sunday, I would call that really a cyclone, but it's just a weak um, warm induction pattern and car density pattern that goes by in the middle of the week. And we'll see, if you look at the forecast, you'll see at least two more events of that sort during the period. But a lot of this area, the southeastern part of the United States is in the warm sector, they're getting lots of just persistent setups for significant precipitation. Yeah. That's the price you pay when you're on the southern extent of the Arctic Air. From much of the late part of the winter, I think that must be it, because you, like you said, the anticyclone keeps pumping the Atlantic back in, and the cold air from Canada sits to the north. You've got a paraclinic zone that's phronogenically active. It's going to rain like crazy there. Right. Haven't we talked about this before? Yeah, yeah. This is something it's reminding me. We're talking about it. Yeah. This persistent southeast, and there may be the feedback between the yeah. Atlantic and the heavy precipitation. That's right. That's what we talked about before. We really should do that. We, we said we were going to try and study that. That's a good idea. And just to finish off, we'll look at the dynamical tropopause. Um, a couple of really neat events. Look at the beta, beta and PD. First of all, let's see if the front that you're referring to from this morning actually shows up. Oh, and it the zero Z. I guess it's in here, but we'll go back to oh, the. Oh, wait, this is uh, this is 12 Z this morning. So let's go back to zero Z last night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, look at that. That's shot across right. Missouri. Yeah, from Missouri, you can see the really right, actually right up in here. That's yeah. Right. So this again, this is dynamical tropopause. For pressure on this, we look at pressure on this, and the sharp contrast in the elevation of the tropopause indicates where these upper fronts that we saw. Um, <coughs> Scott was showing you with this 5D, and with also the analyses themselves, see this really sharp contrast. There's another weaker frontal-like feature that's ahead of it, but this is the um, this is where the upper trough is. Really low dynamical tropopause, but very strong. The gradient of potential vorticity, or in this case, gradient of pressure along the dynamic control. Kind of neat. Um, and just to show, in contrast, this is a pretty robust upper trough. If we go to our 60 hour forecast time where we have that weak wave going by that produces the precipitation. See, this is very weak, very uneventful. Uh, not something you'd get too excited about. I would, would not get excited about Anyway. So again, for the weekend, tomorrow looks pretty decent, warmer than today. Uh, some light snow, light to moderate snow on Sunday, particularly Sunday morning through uh, early afternoon. Kind of ends, and then on Monday into Tuesday, Monday night into Tuesday, another round of snowfall. And getting colder after that. Thank you, Pete, for driving. Thanks, John, for Thank the you, Michael. discussion on current weather. And thanks you all for coming. We'll see you next week. All right. The little convective things going through. It's all with the hail shafts or whatever. Yeah, like yeah. Shafts. Scott Bachmeyer took our data for uh, nice. our industry and we'll move out of there several hours.
You can see the streaming series yeah. farther south. The first one is much easier. It just looks different. It does. It does. It does. It just looks so different. That might be another good question. You know, for people to do something. Is this winter or summer? Take the day off. Yeah. Right. <laughs> It, it does look more muted. I mean, you yeah. you know, you could make an argument. <clears throat> I was looking at the rooftop camera video around this time. The winds near the surface were out of the northwest, and you don't see that really at all on here. Maybe, oh, yeah. Maybe another true. one later on. But there we was definitely low no winds from the northwest, and the upper winds were from the southwest. Mm. Visibly from the northwest. What a weird day that was. Yeah. So many, so many different reasons why. The rope pull that you caught in the earlier imagery, isn't that just like a, the cold pool expanding from the thunderstorms? Well, I don't know. I don't know. It depends. It could be that, I suppose. And then, and Except it's, it's so like, coherent and it doesn't have the same orientation to the main band of, of the convective ring behind it. It kind of intersects it at a funny angle. But it, it's certainly possible. Um, I only was making a guess about the uh, incongruity to try and make some other. Um, you know, guess about why that has that structure, but you could very well be right. 